Hey everyone, my name is Ming and I'm one of the pastors here at Auckland EV. We're dealing with some big questions this month. We've asked our friends, family, workmates, whoever, and asked, what's one big question you have of life, God, or this world? They answered, we bundled them up, and this question was right up there. What happens when you die? Now, that is a big question. And no wonder it's a big question, because we all die. It's something that happens to everyone. Its impact is huge, and it affects all of us. Most of us try not to think about it. We try not to focus on it. Some of you are right in the midst of it. You've had the pain of someone die close to you. And that feeling of loss, the pain and grief that comes from death is real and powerful. We're at its mercy and it comes no matter how hard we try to stop it. Death is inevitable for every single one of us. But the question remains, then what? What happens next? What comes after? Is it good? Should I worry about it? Death is like this, this wall that most of us try not to think about or dare look beyond. But the reality is, all of us have an opinion about it. People have all kinds of beliefs. Humanity has not been short of answers. As I was reading up for this talk, it was fascinating to see the kind of things people experienced. Some people think it's, it's eternal sleep. You know, they, they were declared clinically dead, revived, and then described it as the most peaceful sleep without dreams. Now, I don't know how that works because my sleep without dreams means I'm not even conscious. I remember a few months ago, my son Timothy was, was apparently up all night crying his eyes out. I didn't even wake up. I had no idea that even happened. So how can you come back and say death is just a sleep? How do you know that that was even death? Others have said it's, it's just darkness. They had a near-death experience and said it was just dark. Uh, th then you've got you know, the classic angels at the pearly gates. Or, or maybe it's just a light at the end of the tunnel. Humanity has not been short of answers. Now, into that mix comes what the Bible says. What do you think a pastor of a church is going to say on the topic of what comes after death? I'm guessing it's not a great surprise that I'm going to say there is such a thing. So what I want to do in this talk is, is not so much focus on arguing whether or not death is the end, but show us why this issue matters. How can we know for sure? And why living in light of what comes after changes everything. Now, I just first want to say, while we all might have different opinions about what happens after we die, we need to recognize that those opinions shape everything we do today. But the problem is, not all those opinions can be right at the same time. They can't all be right. On one end of the spectrum, you've got people suggesting that nothing happens. We just rot, we cease to exist, nothing more, no consciousness, no mind, gone. But on the other side, you have the Bible. You have Jesus who says, life doesn't end after this one. Instead, we're, we're taken into a very personal presence of our Creator God, who we will all stand before and must give an account of our lives. These are two very different descriptions of what happens. And these two descriptions are mutually exclusive. You know, there are many things we can differ over. Things that stay true, even though we might differ. Take music, for example. Some people believe that classical music is the best kind of music. Other people believe that K-pop is the best kind of music. Now, this is going to be a shock to some of you, I know. But it's not morally true that you believe that. It's just a taste you have, you see. And I know some of you might be shocked, but it is possible that K-pop can be good to some people and bad for others. That it's not morally wrong to like K-pop and dislike classical music. This can happen at the same time and both still be true. There are some views like that. They're not mutually exclusive. There are some things you can have different opinions about or no opinion at all, and it doesn't matter. And in fact, Sometimes the opinion you have will make it true for you. 
But there are some views where reality jumps in, where your beliefs or opinions can't change the way things are. Take gravity, for example. Top of the 10th floor of a building, and I call out with great confidence and positivity, I don't believe in gravity. It's part of some fundamentalist conspired reality that's been thrown onto us to hold us back from jumping off things. You know, that sort of thing. I don't believe it's true, so I jump off. Now, whether you believe it's true or not, no matter how much faith you have, it won't change the fact that you will land very heavily. There's a reality that will not bend to your convictions. And what happens after death is exactly one of these issues. It's at this point, the differences we have in our society about religion, God, this world, or even Jesus, cease to be relative. Either there is life after death or there isn't. Either Jesus is real or he's not. You can't have both. It's interesting, in a world where we are so into relativism, the idea that it does not matter what opinion you have about God, it's valid. You know those times where people say, good on you, if it's true for you, then it's true for you, but not for me. In a world where relativism is so popular, what happens after we die is one of the places we stop being relativists. It's probably one of the reasons people don't like talking about it. They're forced to show their hand, forced to reveal what they really think about the world. You know, a few years ago, I was chatting to a guy about his thoughts on Jesus. And, and, and you know, I, I really appreciate these kind of conversations. You know, they're real, and I think they're really healthy. So I was chatting to this guy, right? And he said, look, I think it's great some people believe in Jesus the way you do. You know, I think it's really lovely. It's helpful for people, and I think it's true for you. But it's not what I believe, and it's not what others think. We believe different things, and that's true for us. So I asked him, politely, what do you think happens after death? And he said, we cease to exist. Oh, so you're saying we cease to exist. Yes, 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 yes. There's no existence after this life. It just stops. Oh, so my view is no longer a valid view anymore? It's not true for me? No, no. Well, it's just people don't exist after we die. Do you see? Suddenly, he's no longer a relativist. He's objective, fact, false, true, right, wrong. He's convinced there's a reality that will shape and affect all of us. And that's exactly how we all ought to be. What happens after we die? This is an issue of reality, not opinion. Let me show you what I mean. Come with me to 1 Corinthians 15 from verse 3. For I passed on to you as most important what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. And then he appeared to over 500 brothers and sisters at one time. This chapter is a historical letter that describes what the first teachers of Christianity passed on to people. It has four parts, four dimensions centered around the fact that a guy died, was buried, but came back to life. And then he showed himself to hundreds of people. That's the introduction. But then the letter goes on to speak to a particular group of people amongst them. People who don't believe there is such a thing as resurrection from the dead. And his point is this. It's from verse 12. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation is in vain, and so is your faith. Let me draw your attention to what's going on here. What Paul is saying, the author of this letter, what he's saying is the message he proclaimed was falsifiable. It was falsifiable. Now, this is incredibly important to get a hold of. 
You may have heard someone say, look, I believe da 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 da. And it doesn't matter what you say, I'll always believe. You ever hear that kind of comment or attitude? I don't care what you say, I don't care what you bring, I'll always believe. Well, that's not the way the Apostle Paul spoke. This kind of blind faith, it's not biblical faith. It's not the faith of the early Christians. Paul is saying there's something that can completely ruin any convictions and beliefs that we have. And it's this, evidence that Jesus didn't rise from the grave. If Jesus didn't rise, there's no resurrection, no life beyond. And when he means rise, he doesn't just mean resuscitation. He doesn't mean rise from the dead only to die again. He means resurrection, a life that happens after death, never to die again. Christianity rests on this one event, the historic claim that Jesus rose from the grave. If you take that out, Christianity's gone. You might have some kind of religion left, but you, you'd call it tradition or sentimentality. But you wouldn't call it Christianity because Christianity is necessarily bound up with a conviction of real events in human history that tell us about life beyond the grave. Essential is this claim about the resurrection of Jesus. Now, it's really important we get this so we can tell Speak and be aware that we aren't blindly following something, but we're basing it on a conviction of things that really did happen. And if you can show me they didn't, then I'm out of here. You know, it's funny because a lot of my friends, a lot of people I meet disagree with Christianity on the grounds of, of science or philosophy or whatever. But very rarely are they willing to grapple with the history. I think partly it's because we don't realize the sort of tools we need to be using to figure this out. But also partly because the history behind Christianity is very compelling. And that scares some people. Because if what Jesus says about life after death are true, then it changes everything. Let me show you why. What does Jesus' death and resurrection mean for us? What does this tell us about what happens after we die? Come with me to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. And just as it is appointed for people to die once, and after this, face judgment. It's a very plain statement, no fluffing about. All people are destined to die once. And after that, after death, judgment. The Bible is simple and clear. It's a conclusion that cuts through all other options. It rules out reincarnation. People are destined to die once. What is me dies and it doesn't return again and again to die. No, die once. It rules out annihilation. The idea that at the end of my life, there's just nothing. I just rot into the ground and I'm another piece of matter like the other pieces of matter and I disappear, cease to exist. It rules out ideas of a kind of cosmic reconnection, this belief that after death, the life force that is me is swept up and merged with some sort of eternal cosmic consciousness. Some of this might sound crazy, but I grew up being taught a form of Taoism where after you've dealt with all your karma, and reincarnation cycles, death is a release into the cosmos. But if what happened to Jesus is true, all men and women are destined to die once and then face judgment. There is an existence after death and it has judgment. Judgment by a real and personal judge, the Creator God. Now, this is not an isolated idea in the Bible, just from one sentence. Jesus constantly spoke about this. For example, Jesus speaks of it in our reading today from Luke 16. Let's unpack that a little. In Luke 16, we have, a rich, we have an account of two men, a rich man and Lazarus. Now, Jesus shares this story to convey a message he's deeply convinced is true. So, 
we have a rich man who was in luxury every day, and the beggar, Lazarus, who in verse 20 is covered with sores, longing to eat, starving, and he's at the mercy of the rich man. He's completely oppressed and crushed. But in verse 22, when the beggar dies, the angels carried him, up, carried him up to Abraham's side, which is basically to say he was brought before the presence of God in blessing. And the rich man also died and he was buried. But we see in verse 23, the rich man is in torment, in Hades. So the rich man looks up, sees Abraham far away with Lazarus, and he calls out, Father, have pity on me. Send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. Why? Because I am in agony. Abraham, Abraham replies, verse 26, Between us stands this great chasm, and you cannot pass between the two. What we have here is a message Jesus is trying to convey. Jesus is making clear his convictions that there is a life after death and there is a judgment. And this judgment impacts people's eternal destiny. There's a separation between the two that is fixed. There's no crossing back and forth between the two. There is a life beyond, but, but it isn't automatically wonderful. It's not a place, says Jesus, where everyone is automatically ushered into a happy, at-peace existence where all will be well and good. No, there is a separation of people from God into a place he describes of, of torment and agony, a place you don't want to go to, verse 28. And this idea of a separation is everywhere with Jesus. This is not an isolated idea where you can kind of wonder, maybe this just got inserted later. No, no. It is so embedded in all that Jesus taught and did that it's impossible to strip this concept of hell from Jesus' teaching and leave you with anything about the historical Jesus. He talks more about it than anyone else in the New Testament. And he believed it so deeply. He was so concerned about it that he taught, pushed, pressed, urged people never to go there. Here's just one other example, a taste showing Jesus' deep concern. In Mark chapter 9, towards the end, he says, If your hand causes you to stumble and end up in hell, cut it off. It's better to enter life without your hands than end up in hell where the fire never goes out. So intense was his concern, he uses another image and another image. If your foot causes you to stumble. If your eye causes you to stumble, cut it off. Gouge it out. Far better to enter life than be thrown into hell. It's not hard to work out that Jesus is deeply concerned about this. Amidst all the various options about what happens when we die, this one stands as deeply sobering. Judgment. A judgment where real people, many people, are lost eternally. It's a terrifying vision of the future, isn't it? Now, at this point, you may not believe this, but I want to at least bring your attention to the fact that there's a lot at stake. And at this point, I want us to at least avoid the whatevers. You know, if you think back to when you were a teenager, or if you've got teenagers, you know about the whatevers. It's that new word that enters into our vocabularies. You know, if you drive the car that fast in the rain around the corner, you're going to slide out and crash. No, 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 I'll be all right. No, you will crash. Whatever. You heard that one? It's the, that's what you think, this is what I think. We'll just live with our differences, whatever. If you don't study for this exam, you're going to fail. No, I won't. I can always pass exams without studying. No, you will fail. Whatever. I want you to avoid the whatevers on this issue. If what Jesus says about what happens after we die are true, 
It is so serious that if you don't actually deal with it through Him, there is a terrible future awaiting. This is not a whatever issue. All this leads to the next point I want to make and wrestle with. Is it true? How do I work out whether what Jesus is saying is true? How do I work that out? Now, I first want to suggest that you don't work it out by your feelings. Whatever you do, don't work this out just by how you feel. Truth does not get determined by simply your feelings. In our culture, it just feels wrong that there would ever be an existence that some people are condemned. It just feels wrong. And so we can't believe it. We won't have it to be true. But you don't work out reality like that. We have to face the facts. And what we get to decide is how we respond to them. The question is, are there facts? Is there evidence that helps us to know there is life beyond death? There is, but before I get there, I first want to say, any evidence that I share with you has someone on the internet dismissing it. If you are searching for the knockout argument that no one disputes, you will search in vain. But just because there is argument against something doesn't mean the point that's being presented is wrong or has no merit. In fact, this is the case with every issue in life that has something of substance hanging on it. If there's anything where there's a consequence that hangs on it, someone will dispute it. That's why we have lawyers, isn't it? Because anything that matters will get disputed. And so, with this issue, what happens after death? There is so much hanging on it. So much impact that, and consequences that flow from it onto us that it's practically impossible to be objective about it. See, if Jesus is who he says he is, if there's a life beyond and it's as Jesus says it is, my life will have to change. Your life will have to change. You cannot keep living as if your life is yours. We'll start to see that, that I'm made by a creator to whom I owe my existence and before whom one day I'll stand and give an account of my life, be judged, and that will impact every moment of my existence today, if that's all true. Now, if I don't want that to be true, I don't want to see any evidence. My point is this. Be aware that so much is at stake personally that objectivity is difficult. Be aware of how much that colors the way you see any evidence. So much that the best and only place to start this investigation is in our hearts. That is to say, are we really coming to this question as honest inquirers? Or do we have a vested interest in this not being true? Now, how do you determine if you're an honest inquirer? I think one of the easiest ways is to ask yourself the question, if I find this true, am I truly prepared to hand my whole life over to this Jesus fellow? Have my life be changed in every way he calls on it to be changed? Am I up for that? Because if you're not actually prepared to go where the truth takes you, if you're not prepared to be like that, you're actually quite biased against it being true. I hope you see that. The best and only place to start this investigation is our own hearts. Now, there's lots of places I wanted to go to, but the bottom line is the death and resurrection of Jesus. If this event happened, this series of events happened, there's no more debate. You could be in the middle of a university lecture discussing the irrationality of believing life after death and mounting this formidable case for death being the end. But it'll all count for nothing if a dead guy who resurrected walks back in. It won't matter how many eminent philosophers like your ideas if the fact is a dead guy comes back to life, resurrected, never to die again. So the central thing to do is look at fact, not philosophy, not feelings, not experience, but history. That's the task we have. This is why Christians are so confident about this. 
Have a look at 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. Have a look at the nature of Christianity. For we did not follow cleverly contrived myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Instead, we were eyewitnesses of His majesty. See that? At the center of, of the Christian claim is not just the ideas of some enlightened guru, not some dream someone had. At the center of the Christian faith is the claim about an event in history, an event a bunch of people saw. They didn't make up. We've had people die for a couple of minutes and come back, but all eventually die again. Jesus dies for three days, dead and buried. And he comes back to life never to die again. Christianity isn't just some ideas that someone thought was a great idea to live by. Christianity stands by God who stepped into history, into objective time and space, and you can test and check whether it's true. So deep is the concern of our Creator that we might know, that you might know objectively that these things are real that there is a judgment, that there is more to life than this, than this life. And to live life, if this life is it, is foolishness. To be distracted by all the entertainment, all the values of this world that sees nothing more than this is a mistake. Because Jesus is offering us life. In John chapter 11, Jesus says, I am the resurrection. Come to me and have life. How? By putting your life in Jesus' hands. He died so we didn't have to. He took and faced the judgment that's coming for us. And He rose, showing us the life to come for those who trust in Him. Revelation 21 paints a picture of this life. And it says in verse 3, Look, God's dwelling is with humanity and He will live with them. They will be His peoples and God Himself will be with them and will be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will, no, will be no more. Grief, crying and pain will be no more because the previous things have passed away. That's the life in store for those who trust in Jesus. And what an incredible picture that is, isn't it? This is why Christians are always banging on about Jesus. He didn't just come to tell us what's next, warn us about judgment, but to face it for us and secure our future. Now look, I don't want to pretend that this is all smackdown conclusive, that people will have heard all this and, and fall down saying, oh, I'm convinced now. I get it. I've rushed through things. There's way more to consider. You need to weigh it up. But I want to encourage you to consider the evidence. There's lots more places to do that. Maybe come back next week. We'll be looking at the trustworthiness of the Bible. Ask for some book suggestions on your Connect card later. But you know the best place to start? The best place to start is a Bible. Real historic documents. But don't start in Genesis. Start in Mark or Matthew. Take a risk. Pray. Ask God. Let me be open to the truth and go where it takes me. I'd love to read the Bible with you or help you find someone you feel comfortable reading it with to explore it together. Let me know on your Connect cards. But as we wrestle with this big question, is death the end? God, the creator of this universe, He's telling us no. The grief, the pain we experience from death and losing loved ones, the way we live our lives, trying to fill it with meaning, purpose that lasts. All of that points to the fact that we were made for life that lasts. But above all, it's the resurrection of Jesus that smashes the wall standing between us and the next life. And He comes to tell us that this is how it is. God has given us a massive amount of information so we might know the truth. I urge you to pursue it. Pursue it and find the life that Jesus offers. The life based on reality, based on history. That life, not judgment, can be our future because we trust Jesus secured it for us. How amazing Jesus is. 
Let's pray, thanking God for him. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you sent your Son. You sent your Son to reveal the truth to us, but not only to reveal that truth to us, that we might know that death is not the end, but that he secured our future, that we do not have to face this judgment, but Jesus faced it for us. Might we take hold of this? Might we look into it? And might we hold fast and trust it? Trust your son Jesus and put our life in his hand. Help us to not live as if this life is it, but to live with an eternal perspective. Live for the life that is coming in your son Jesus Christ. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.